Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Smith, Director of Admissions and Financial Aid for Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. I'm coming to you live from campus, standing in front of Avery Hall, the home of GSAP. We're very excited that you were able to join us this week. There's gonna be some great events, chances to connect with students, faculty, alumni, uh, sit in on some courses and really just get a feel for everything that our master's programs offer. So I'm going to pass things on to our uh, current students who are gonna be giving you a tour and some background on the school and their experience. So first off, uh, Uri, why don't you go ahead? Hi y'all, my name is Uri Chiyagugwa. I am a third year MRAC student. Um, I'm originally from Nigeria. I completed my Bachelor of Science in Architecture degree um, from the University of Texas at San Antonio and started here at GSAP in the fall of 2019, so last fall. And I'm excited to be here and show you around. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Gonzalez. I'm a current MS Red student. Um, I graduated from Binghamton University in 2018 and in 2019 with a bachelor's and master's. I'm here at Columbia University I'm studying real estate development. And my focus is in affordable housing and impact investing. I'm excited to be here. And thanks everyone for, for coming out. Um, I can't wait to show you our portion of the presentation. Hi everyone, um, I'm Kaylee Streeter. I'm originally from Miami, Florida and graduated from Barnard College with a Bachelor's of Arts in Architecture in 2018. And I'm currently in my second year getting my Master's of Architecture at GSEP. Hi everyone, my name is Abhinav Gupta and I'm originally from Montreal, Canada. I did my a Bachelor's in Political Science and Economics at McGill University. And now I'm in my third year at GSAP in my MARC. So uh, I'm actually gonna get started here. And uh, I know that all of you obviously know a lot about where GSAP stands. Um, and so I just wanna, I just wanna go a little more into uh, knowing what you're signing up for. So again, you, you know that it's one of the first architecture schools in America. It's really one of the best architecture schools on the planet. And you all already know that. It's why you're trying to get here, right? So what do you really know about GSAP? And I think that's an important question to ask. I'm here to give you a little bit of a reminder of what you become part of when you come to GSAP. When you come to Avery, you're not really coming to an architecture school. You're coming to a library with an architecture school inside of it. And I don't mean that metaphorically. Avery is a library and GSAP is a school that sits within that library. In fact, the studios sit on it and it just expands underground many more levels than you would believe. And I remind you, it's also not just a library. It's the biggest, most extensive architecture library and archive in America. And really, it's just the library and archive at the AA in London that's the one that competes with ours. So while you're working in studios, you're only steps away from holding an original Piranesi drawing in your hands or being face to face with the original New York City Commissioner's Plan from 1811 that defined the grid. Any of you know about the grid? Um, if you don't, don't worry about it. Kelly and Josh are definitely going to get you on the grid in a moment. So that's just an idea of some of the things that you can find right next to your studios. What always interested me was the contemporary collected works. So for example, you can feel the original embossed prints by Peter Eisenman under your fingertips or Bernard Schumi's Manhattan transcripts. And I mean the real Manhattan transcripts and their original packaging. There's nothing quite like it. So of course, there are more steps to Avery in the COVID times, but Avery is also open and it's open with a great deal of safety. So you're still going to get all of those opportunities and they are not opportunities to be missed. Now, for our campus, McKim, Mead and White actually designed the campus in line with how a lot of architects in America were designing campuses at the time. But there are more than a few weird things about our campus. Columbia used to be downtown. And when it was King's College uh, at that time, it was downtown. It, it, later, it moved up to its current location, much later. And now, of course, it's uptown in its home in Morningside. But where did Columbia move to? It actually moved to an asylum. And it's in fact, one of Columbia, one of the Columbia GSAP buildings, the Buell building, which houses the Buell Center for American Architecture and the amazing Ross Gallery, you have to check it out. Um, you can definitely check out portions of what's on exhibit, 
exhibit there online right now. Um, it's the only remaining building from the asylum. Uh, and so it's the oldest building on campus. It looks like one of the newest because it's not actually done in the revivalist style that the rest of the campus was done in. But when you get to campus, you're gonna realize that the campus is sort of hidden. It's cool. The buildings next to the entryways on Broadway and Amsterdam sort of disappear. And the main piazza just appears as you round the corner. But while that is cool, there's a bit more to it. The campus is both hidden and raised on a plinth because when it was designed, it was designed to keep people out. Specifically, it was designed to keep Harlem out. And it's not a history that we're trying to forget. It's one of the political realities of Columbia and the history of racism at Columbia. And you have to face that head on every day. The notion of how spaces are political and how spaces do coerce bodies is something that we as an institution need our students, especially our architecture students, to be willing to do something, to understand it, and to do something about it. So in any case, these are some of the things that you're going to be thinking about as you're going to be on your way to Avery. And for now, it's an amazing area to just come and think, even if you're not basically living at campus full time, all the time anymore. Also, I do want to mention one more thing that's sort of interesting about our campus. Um, ask your history profs about this. We do have tunnels. There, I can confirm there are secret tunnels running under the entire campus, and legend has it that they go everywhere. But anyway, when you have a chance, ask Reinhold or Andrew about it whenever you can, because it'll be worth your time. So coming back to this, when you're here and you think about these things on your way to Avery, you're following along a long line of thinkers that were challenging and changing the institution in the same ways that you were going to be doing. Peter Eisenman was a student. Bernard Schumi was a dean, and he's now a professor, so you could be a student. Mark Wig Wigley was a dean and is also a professor. And if you don't already know him, Mark Wigley, actually, while at GSAP, um, or just before GSAP, was the curatorial mind uh, of the 88 Decon exhibition at MoMA. And between Wigley's ex exhibition, uh, Shumi, GSAP founded uh, the famed and probably more infamous paperless studio, widely credited for bringing experimental digital and computational processes to architecture schools in America when most of the schools in America were not doing it. So Paperless Studio propelled the school forward, bringing in legendary architects um, and architects that you're very familiar with that many of you might call star architects. Um, but the reason that happened at all was because of this history between this exhibition and GSAP. And it's a history that obviously is uni unique to the relationships that GSAP brings to New York. So, now, of course, this not only happened as profs, but as students. Our students are willing to engage with culture, and they're presenting at all the biennials and triennials that you can name. They're Rome Prize winners, but they're also people like Harmon of Shreve Lab and Harmon that actually uh, designed the Empire State Building. Uh, there's Beverly Green, the first Black woman in America to get licensed in architecture, working on things like the UNESCO headquarters uh, in Paris. Uh, Sharon Sutton, who's the 12th Black woman in America to get licensed in architecture and the first to herself become a professor. You may also know her for bringing the civil rights movement into architecture. If you haven't read her book, um, When Ivory Towers Black, you really need to do it if you have any interest in civil rights and architecture at all. Um, moreover, Norma Sklarik, um, no, known as the Rosa Parks of architecture, considering that she was, she was running the show on the East Coast and the West Coast in a field where generally it was mostly white men running the show. So it's an incredible, incredible network um, that she used that she got a GSAP um, to do that. And it's because a lot of firsts for a lot of people happened at GSAP. Um, and coming to sort of more contemporary times, everyone's quite familiar with DSR. And, you know, both two partners from DSR went to GSAP. Um, obviously, one of them, uh, one Renfro, one uh, MacArthur grant. Uh, Shop, for example. All six of the partners at SHOP went to GSAP and did their MARC at GSAP. Um, and moreover, you may be familiar with uh, movies like uh, Tron Legacy, Oblivion, um, and the upcoming Top Gun Maverick, um, the sequel to Top Gun. Joe Kaczynski, the director, went to GSAP, fell in love with rendering. And you, know, you have the option to do that sort of rendering at GSAP um, that you've seen in those movies and go into different sorts of digital media. So my point is that when you're coming to GSAP, you're a piece of that. And honestly, GSAP is in New York. COVID or not, this is the city where it's at. 
every city has its own culture and its own things that you find out about when you've been there for a little bit. But New York might be the only city in the world where anybody from anywhere knows something about its culture and about the ins and outs of it, about how fast that culture moves. And it's because New York sets a bar for living the city life. And with that, Kaylee and Josh, take it away. So Josh and I are going to tell you all a little bit about living in the neighborhood. I've lived between the Upper West Side and Sugar Hill um, in the context of school for about seven years now. And Josh has lived in Morningside Heights um, and Harlem for 25 years. So I've lived in five different apartments across four of the neighborhoods we're gonna talk about today. And I've had the same roommate for three of these apartments. She went to undergrad with me and is also getting um, an MRG at GSAP. And we currently live in a two bedroom, but we've converted our living room into a studio space and have also lived with uh, UD and red students from GSAP in the past. So it's kind of a very, you know, Columbia GSAP neighborhood um, across the, the five places we're gonna share with you today. All right, everyone. Um, yeah, so I also have like lived in New York City my entire life. Um, I'm 25 years old. I was born and raised here. Um, as Kaylee said, I lived in I lived in Harlem and Morningside Heights, but I've also lived in um, Washington Heights. I lived a bit outside of the city um, in Westchester, and I also went to school in New York State. And I lived in Binghamton for six years. So not only am I a resident of New York City, but I've also been uh, around uh, New York State as well. And been to various cities, towns. So um, I did spend six years away from the city. Um, so I did get to kind of experience what it is like to, you know, live in and outside of the city and get that perspective. And I just recently moved back. So I'm glad to be glad to be here. And I'm glad to be able to share with you my experience. And, you know, just the city that I love and hold near and dear to my heart. So without further ado. Um, so first, we're going to just walk you through the neighboring districts um, that surround the university. Um, so the first neighborhoods that you'll see are going to be the uh, Upper West Side, which is comprised of two different districts, um, and which are right here. So they're to the south of the campus. Next you have Morningside Heights, which is where I currently live and where the university resides. This entire area right here. We're gonna show you a little bit of the amenities that are in the area. You have Mount Morris, which is this huge orange area right here, right above Central Park. You have Manhattanville and West Harlem, which is this area right here. You'll see a lot of uh, development going on in, um, with Columbia University, um, especially with new, building new campus spaces and um, new areas, uh, if you ever get the chance to go into the area. And we have Vinegar Hill, a little small uh, you know, district uh, between um, Manhattanville and Hamilton Heights. Uh, Hamilton Heights is a low rise area, beautiful, known for its brownstones. It's an amazing walk um, if you ever get the chance to walk around that area, especially in the fall. And Sugar Hill, also uh, a very low rise and beautiful historical neighborhood um, filled with a ton of brown zones and a ton of small local businesses. Next, you have Harlem, uh, one of the more famous neighborhoods in all of New York City, um, a primarily uh, and historically black neighborhood, a lot of culture and music um, and just, you know, wonderful art has come from the neighborhood. And that's where I spent a lot of my time growing up. Okay, great. So we're going to share a video with you and walk you through, walk you through some of our favorite places um, in these neighborhoods. So let's let's go on a tour. There you go. So we're going to start just on Columbia's campus, which we kind of talked about um, with Abinas. And What's great about the campus is it's kind of bordered between many parks. We have access to Morningside and Riverside and Central Park. And along with kind of the lawns on campus, you, there's lots of opportunities to be outdoors. Um, and so the first park that we're, we're gonna talk about is Riverside Park. Yep, so we have Riverside Park. Um, it's a beautiful uh, walking area. Um, I really enjoy it because it's kind of like a peaceful little getaway from, you know, the concrete jungle that you see over here. Um, and it has a lot of running trails, a lot of uh, different amenities like basketball courts, skate parks. It's just a great place to be. 
And then you have the Hungarian pastry shop, which is one of my personal favorites. They have a lot of European pastries. Um, my favorite is personally is the, uh, the chocolate croissant. Um, and they have unlimited coffee, which is great. And you'll have a lot of students actually um, going to the shop and just hanging out, reading books, doing work. It's really beautiful. It's also yeah. no Wi-Fi, so it's a great place to, <laughs> to write papers. There's no Wi-Fi, yeah, <laughs> or outlets, oh my God. Um, and then you have the, the cathedral, uh, St. John the Divine. Um, it's the biggest cathedral in the Northeast and was actually built as a response uh, to St. Patrick's uh, Cathedral. Then you have the West Harlem Piers, um, which are like a, a recent development. You have a number of restaurants, you have a, a huge um, uh, local space, like a, a square where people just hang out and, you know, um, hang out and relax. And it's a very peaceful area to be. It's right next to the road. And up from up the Hudson to Riverbank State Park, um, if you live in Hamilton Heights while you're at GSAP, you definitely would visit this Riverbank State Park. Um, amazing views of the city of the Hudson, Hudson of the George Washington Bridge, which connects uh, Manhattan to New Jersey. Um, it's a great kind of getaway. So now we're gonna move to the Honeywell, which is a bar in Hamilton Heights. Uh, it kind of feels like the tagline is your grandma's basement. Um, and they have really fun cocktails. And now they have a wonderful little garden for outdoor seating. And then also in Hamilton Heights is the Monkey Cup, which is kind of a hideaway little um, coffee shop that has pastelitos, which was really important for me coming from Miami to find a spot where I could get my guava pastries. Mm -hmm. Next we'll be moving to the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. It's an amazing, beautiful space, uh, especially to take like um, younger folk. Um, and it's an educational museum. So uh, if you go, it, it just has amazing art and amazing um, experiences. So Lucille's Coffee and Cocktails is part of um, this coffee branch with Manhattanville Coffee, which is in Sugar Hill as well. And uh, the owners are fantastic and everyone is local. And if you go more than twice, the barista will remember you. Um, it's kind of that kind of neighborhood place. And then next we're going to Manhattanville Coffee. Um, fun fact about Manhattanville, it's where I submitted my application for GSAP. Um, it's it's on Edgecombe Avenue also, which is tied for my favorite between Edgecombe Avenue and Convent Avenue, which you'll get to know in New York. And then a short walk away is the Edge Harlem, which is right next to St. Nicholas Park. And the Edge is also a local business with amazing uh, food and a great brunch and fantastic owners who I also recommend you befriend. <laughs> Yep, so now we're going over to St. Nicholas Park. Um, uh, it ha it's actually a massive park that has a bunch of uh, smaller, more historical parks that are named after um, Black folk. Um, you'll also find a lot of walking trails there. It's easy to bike or bike through. Um, you have like handball courts and everything. It's, it's just a great space to get away. So a lot of green space in the area. Next, we're gonna go to Sylvia's, which is a historically Black owned restaurant. It's owned by the Woods family. Um, they helped actually build the Harlem economy. And the Red Rooster is another great cocktail bar, a huge bar, an amazing space just to go and relax and eat. Um, it's one of the more social spaces in Harlem. Um, and then next we're gonna go to the Angel of Harlem, which is one of my personal favorite uh, cocktail bars. It's always, um, it's always fun to be and it's always, uh, it's always jumping <laughs> to be honest, especially at night. So it's a great nightlife bar. Um, then you have Marcus Garvey Park. It's a beautiful, beautiful space. It has a huge baseball field. Um, there's a lot of uh, natural rock formations that you can just climb um, and a lot of open picnic space too. So just a great way to, to, get, uh, to get away from everything, especially if you live in the area. And an interesting fact about Marcus Garvey Park is the Harlem Fire Watchtower was actually recently restored by um, a group of individuals in the community and also GSAP alums. Then you have a Harlem, the Harlem Tavern, which is more of a tourist location, huge, huge tavern in the area, and Morningside Park. 
um, which is also one of my favorite places to walk around, go to the ponds, bike through, run through. Um, I like to play uh, pick up Frisbee games there. It's a really nice place to be, especially in the spring and in the summer, huge open fields. I think now we're going to season vegan. Yep, one of my <laughs> personal favorites. Yep. So the first black owned vegan restaurant in New York City and the owners are really sweet, really nice people. It's a family of four that, that owns it. Um, <laughs> also seasoned vegan was designed by an AAD alum, Kyle Spence. And the design was kind of a participatory design with the community. Um, so kind of everyone came and brought pennies and laid them into the tile work and uh, an artist from a tattoo shop nearby painted the murals. And finally, we're kind of ending in Central Park, uh, which is kind of, you know, the center of Manhattan. And we wanted to remind everyone that, you know, this neighborhood is incredible. And, and I think we both feel lucky to, to live here, um, but New York is also bigger than, bigger than this, this little bubble. Mm -hmm. you know, we definitely encourage you to go and explore. There are five boroughs to see, a bunch of different spots you can go to in Staten Island, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, um, and even in Manhattan. So if you ever get the chance to come to New York City, don't be afraid to explore. You can live here all of your life and never you know, experience everything. You'll never be able to go to every restaurant, never be able to go to every you know, art exhibition, um, <laughs> every shop. So you have a lot to do and a lot to have fun with. And if you'd like to go to the last slide. Mm -hmm. It's also nice to, to know that Central Park has been a hub kind of in hybrid learning for those of us in the city. This is, this is where we hang out, where we see each other, um, social distance with our studios and kind of keep the GSAP community in, in this park that even if you, you, do, you don't live in one of these neighborhoods, the park is central. We can all meet there pretty easily. Yep. Which would bring us to hyper learning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hi, y'all. Congratulations and welcome to the GSAP Open House. My name is Urechi Ogugwa. I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. I completed my Bachelor of Science degree in architecture from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, December of 2017 and in the fall of 2019 I joined a community here at GSAP. Currently I am in the third year of my Master of Architecture program. I currently live in Washington Heights which is a comfortable enough distance from campus where I can simply hop under one train and be in studio within a few minutes. Although I've not had to do a lot of that this semester following COVID-19 protocols which very quickly changed the format for classes as we knew it. So I'm sure everyone has a lot of questions about how these virtual or hybrid studios work. I'll be sharing my personal experience with online classes this semester. And because every student is experiencing this period very differently, I'll be inviting some of my colleagues and friends enrolled in different programs at GSEP to share their experiences as well. So each MRC student has a designated computer which can be accessed remotely from the studios to wherever it is that you're working in the world. Seating is choreographed so that no two students are seated next to each other at any given time. The studios and work hours are scheduled on a rotational basis to regulate the number of students in the building at all times because, well, safety, there's still a virus out there. For studios that take advantage of the hybrid format, students meeting in person take the designated seats in the space while their colleagues who, for different reasons, are attending studio online, zoom into the studio via the large monitors located in each studio space so that even though everyone can be in person, there's still some semblance of studio culture. My friend Lucas is in one of such studios as he's attending GSAP virtually from Natal, Brazil um, as a first year student. So I spoke with Lucas. It's nice uh, to see the studio environment, even though it's empty and just with like four or five people. Yeah. It felt like I'm sure yeah. it felt so good for the students that uh, they are in New York that should be there, but also 
feels good for us that are in another country or are in the same country yeah. online to see a different environment than the room yeah. from, from people who yeah. this is squares. So it's a change of yeah. scenario that it really helps. It kind of surprised me positively. Uh, yeah, that the way it's going, uh, I think that I'm being able to take advantage of a lot of things and really learn. Uh, so yeah, it's been good. Of course, not the ideal, but it's uh, for a studio for me is the most the the weirdest of it, of it all because we are studying Broadway. So to actually uh, analyze a city uh, or a street, uh, an avenue that you're not there, it's 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 been a challenge. For my third year studio, all of our classes have been held primarily online, so I mostly attend through Zoom from my home in Washington Heights, but sometimes I do take advantage of the studio spaces that are available to us, because I get most of the space to myself and it's a lot more reliable internet. Actually, the first time members of my studio met each other this semester was for a site visit that we had to East Village, New York, um, like one week before midterms. So it's definitely been a challenge navigating this new world, especially witnessing the contrast between this fall semester and say last fall semester. I spoke with my friend Skylar, who like me, has had to switch over from the so-called conventional studio format. Skylar is also in her third year of the AMAC program, but has been at GSEP for all three years of her program. The biggest adjustment for me was to figure, like, f just figuring out what works for you because it's not like you have your, the setup that they give you at Avery, so, like, trying to get your computer set up um, how you want it so that you can have the most, pro like, the most productive space possible and then being at home. I hope that answers some of your questions. Thank you so much for listening and see you around. Yeah, so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about my experience. So I've only been in the program for about two months now. You know, I'm just fresh into the program. Um, but I can say that this has been one of the most academically fulfilling experiences I've ever had in my entire life. No, actually the most academically fulfilling experience I've ever had in my entire life. Um, I think for me personally, I've actually really enjoyed the hybrid learning model because it's actually um, been working really well here at MS Red. Um, my cohort and I have really been um, navigating the spaces really well because it helps us network with one another. Um, because we're not, you know, in person and, you know, we don't have that luxury of just being able to see each other all the time, you know, kind of take, kind of take that for granted. Um, we want, we, we're more incentivized to see each other and to meet up and to, you know, discuss with one another, work together. Um, and I think we've really adapted to the space really well. Um, I do have one in-person class, which is my finance course. And the way that it's set up is that we're in an auditorium, which is the woods um, in Avery, which is located in the basement. <laughs> um, and it's really socially distanced. I feel extremely safe. Um, and our professor, uh, Patrice Darrington, also really manages the class really well and makes sure, make sure that we're socially distanced and that we're there for the exact time that we have to be. Um, so I think it's been a really understanding and patient experience. And professors have been so understanding and willing to work with us um, that it's just made the experience, the overall experience, enjoyable, um, satisfying, and you know, just an overall great education. Um, I'm glad that I was able to, you know, experience this because at first I was worried and I did have anxiety um, about you know attending and doing class over Zoom and everything, but I've really adapted well, and I think everyone in my cohort has adapted well. Even those who are not able to join us physically, um, internationally, we've learned how to work with people from different countries all across the planet. We've learned how to be mindful of other people's time zones. I mean, it's really made us better leaders and, and you know, better uh, workers in the academic and professional environment. Um, so, you know, my experience with hybrid learning, I think, has been overall positive. So this semester for me has you know, been an interesting one. I think time zones are an interesting place to start because there are so many different time zones at one time in a class and partnerships become really interesting. 
um, my housing partner in the second year at Emmerich, there's the housing studio and you have a housing partner that you work with you know, very intimately and intensely for a semester. And she was living in Dubai. So there was this, and I'm in New York, so there was this time zone that we're constantly, you know, being patient with each other to work, you know, appropriate hours for for ourselves. And um, there's a lot of negotiations constantly happening. In in terms of going to campus and um, you know seeing familiar faces, that's really nice as well. And I I think it's been nice also the classes that kind of overlap with different programs and different uh, MR years because you still get to meet new faces um, constantly, which is part of the excitement of school. Yeah, I, it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting time uh, doing this sort of hybrid model um, in that I think it's made, I think you guys have both said it in that both of both you guys said patience. And I think patience is a real thing that's been learned um, in doing the hybrid model um, in terms of everything has, all communication has to be so much more deliberate, being mindful of where people are at, being mindful of how you're going to communicate because we're using new interfaces and different interfaces for communication. Um, and moreover, honestly, uh, it, it sort of, it gives you the opportunity to have much more pointed reviews, to be quite honest. And you might notice that if you drop in on some of the mid reviews this week, you're going to find that um, having these new interfaces like Miro boards or even just Zoom itself means that you can focus on a drawing and you can focus everybody's attention on a drawing or at a certain moment. And you can even mark up that certain moment uh, right, right on the screen. And so I think the abilities that come from all the technological affordances of this moment actually makes for a lot, a lot better communication. Uh, it's just, it's, it's really interesting to see that um, in, in, any, in any way, for example, uh, as, as it's been brought up, people in different time zones, um, you know, it's the way that they're integrated in, in the class is actually really interesting because people are, people are actually in the time zone or in the part of the world that they're in. And so whatever's happening there is now part of your, part of your collaboration with them. So it's, it's actually a lot more of this sort of international atmosphere, almost amplified in some way that you usually find in studios at GSAP. Um, and of course, going to GSAP, there, you still have the ability to be in studio or use the shop. Um, and it's, it's funny because usually it might be a bit of a madhouse in the studios or in the shop. And now because, because we have to be a lot safer, it's like a lot calmer. And so it's, yeah, I think you can definitely find a lot of silver linings um, that I think you can, you can make that, that can actually make your, your studio experience um, even better um, during this time. Uh, and obviously, you know, hopefully when things uh, sort of move forward, um, we'll be able to carry a lot of the lessons that we've learned during this time. Uh, and so I think it's, honestly, there's, there's a, I think a really positive outlook <laughs> for, for all of us. I can answer the question um, directly to me. Um, as a Barnard alumna, I am too. Did you find the teaching learning style similar to your undergraduate experience? Did it ease your transition? I think that question specific, but can also kind of be broadened out to kind of the transition from undergraduate experiences to um, GSAP. Specifically um, in thinking about kind of if you're in an architecture program that's more theory based or more kind of technology or, or construction based. Um, the program that I was in was definitely more theory based and more kind of historical um, with studios that kind of focused on research. And I think the transition to GSAP was, was, was nice. I think a lot of professors will kind of play to your strengths, but also allow you to specifically with the MRC and with, within studio will want you to kind of, you know, try something new as well. Um, so if they see that you're more research based, they'll give you that time, but also know that you have to start drawing sections and plans and, and quickly. Um, but you learn and, and you learn how to, how you think and 
how you'd like to how you'd like to you know engage with your own studio practices there's definitely more freedom than in undergrad i can answer the question on um the affordability of the neighborhood um so i've lived here my entire life uh, i grew up on 110th and 109th street um so i've relatively seen the neighborhood um, change throughout uh, a number of years um, and I can confidently say that, yes, the neighborhood is very affordable, um, especially with the uh, real estate market that we currently live in. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, big name restaurants and eateries and uh, grocery stores, but there's also a lot of mom and pop shops that you'll find. Um, a lot of sweet spots that you can, you know, go to um, for food, for, har for anything, um, you know, any hard hardware related items. Um, laundry, things like that. I mean, it all depends also what, you know, apartment living situation um, you end up in, but I really do think it's affordable. I mean, there's so much accessibility in this neighborhood. Um, like how we said during our neighborhood tour, right? There's a lot of uh, green space. There's a lot of different, um, you know, coffee shops, restaurants, um, experiences in the neighborhood, and they all vary in, in price. Um, but I'd say that there isn't anything, you know, quote unquote outrageous um, in the area. Um, so I'd say it's a relatively, or one of the, one of the more affordable neighborhoods um, around Manhattan. I can uh, answer the uh, question about uh, sort of international benefits for international students. Um, you know, obviously I'm coming from Canada, so it's, it's not that far, but I think there are a lot of, um, you know, there's a reason why I wanted to come here and, I've, you know, beyond a lot of the, you know, similar reasons, I think a lot of us uh, come here. I think the the benefit is that New York is definitely a big factor in this, and I think that's true for anybody who, who's considering GSAP. I, I think it's true that you're considering New York, right? And I think that's a that's a really important part of it. Aside from GSAP itself being sort of, a, and you're going to hear this a lot, but it isn't it isn't untrue that GSAP is a microcosm of of New York, but New York City is is definitely. It it built you you build a resilience, and I think it's a it's a really important thing to learn that you, that you build that resilience, um, especially in architecture. And I think the major advantage, aside from all of the fun you can also have in New York, is that when you build that resilience, you're going to leave GSAP with a resilience that you may not find at other places. Um, and, and again, it's not because nurturing isn't there, you know, you'll, you'll be able to find nurturing based on the relationships that you build relationships with your peers, with your professors. Um, but it's, it's really about, um, just the, the realities of living in this dense city that, you know, can be amazing, can be difficult, really difficult, um, but exceptionally rewarding. So, you know, like it's a really... I think that, you know, that resilience is going to be worth it. Um, I can actually touch on the uh, work experience question as well. Um, so in MS Red, um, our real estate development uh, program, we actually are, um, we're incentivized and it's also built into the program to work in and apply for internship positions. So in our first semester, um, you would, in your first semester, if you attend MS Red, you essentially would, you know, take a, a large portion of the core classes um, that the program requires, and then for the uh, for the uh, fall and spring sessions, you would be doing your internship. So we have a great uh, career services counselor. Her name is Rebecca Palomita. Um, she's really amazing. Um, she's always open to meeting. She's one of the most available um, career counselors I've ever experienced, um, and she's you know, very willing to help you get that internship, get that job. Um, I have never felt this supported before in an academic institution um, and because I've never had that personal catering um, like MS Red has. Um, and I definitely do feel the motivation to apply to an internship, to get these positions and explore different types of um, work environments that I may have never experienced before. Um, so for example, I'm someone who just came straight from school. I don't have um, you know, a career built up or a career background, but you'll find at MS Red that a lot of people already do. Um, and so you'll, ha you'll have a mixture of, of different folks, but that doesn't really matter because I, I already, I feel encouraged to, you know, go into those different careers, go into those internships, and everyone in the program is pretty encouraging um, and can even give you insight onto what types of internships or positions that you can 
apply to. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. I'd like to thank our panelists again, the students for taking the time and for everyone for joining these sessions. Um, we are going to have many other sessions this week where all of the other questions can be answered. Uh, each program will have a session with current students um, and the program directors and faculty. Uh, there's a few links in the chat that you can see for uh, uh, Dean and faculty uh, MARC and AAD overview. That's going to start right at 12. Then at the end of the week, uh, don't miss a chance to connect with uh, Stefan Buttaker and myself for an admissions and financial aid session. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us at arch underscore admissions at columbia.edu, A-R-C-H underscore admissions at columbia.edu. Put that in the chat as well. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy the events and hopefully see you here at GSAP in the future. Thank you all again.